Mrs. Fumi Faloye. Fumi Faloye is the MD and CEO of World and Travel Land, a company aimed at giving its clients an exceptional hitch-free travel experience. She established the company after school 17 years ago. Under her watch, World Travel Land has become a renowned travel management company establishing business relationships with top airlines, tour operations, and cruise companies in the world. She also pioneered Wantra brand as well as 365 Travel Plan, which are offshoots of World and Travel Land, the parent company. Fumi Faloye holds a BSc in Chemical Engineering from University of Lagos, an alumnus of Harvard Business School. She has also received entrepreneurial training from the Enterprise Development Center, Lagos. Good evening, everyone. I see some familiar faces. My friend is here. My business colleague is there. And I thought, hmm, do I really want them here? But it's OK. <laughs> um, OK, do I have the slides? Um, before we go into the slides, I think the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, we hear this a lot. Are entrepreneurs made or born? And if I ask Shola that, she'll say they're born. If she looks at me, she'll say they're born. And that's because I was born an entrepreneur. So who am I? I'm the only girl in a family of five. I'm the first child. In a very small family again. So my father is the only child. His mother and then married a beautiful woman that had only three children. So you can put the whole extended family, that's what I'm trying to say, in just a dining table. So we're that close to my grandma, to my father, and all that. Um, in year two, my mother is a businesswoman. I come from a family of very strong women. Very strong. My grandma never married, had my father at the age of 20. So they decided not to pay for her school fees again. She's a full negotiant. So for them, the first thing is she got pregnant for this man from they don't know where. Her sisters still went to school, but she stopped. So she started doing business. And she was a very successful businesswoman, very. And had the son, now tried to get married, got married, and never had a child. So imagine you had this child that, if you have to say, you say, this is my bad luck. You know what I mean? This child that stares at you, and every man that comes is saying, who is this child? And you got married, and you never had a child. So you had to run back and start looking for that child. But at that time, you've lost something. You've lost the connection. So she had that. She was struggling with that for years. So she wanted him to get married by all means. So he married this beautiful woman. In fact, my, my mom always says, my dad, my grandma was the one that proposed, not the man. She had three children. So for her, she has just had children. So I grew up calling my grandma mommy, and I was calling my mom auntie. Because as a child, nobody could see Fumio when she was a baby. When you call my granny, say, she's sleeping. She's sleeping. Why? Because she didn't want anybody to touch a yellow popo that God has finally given her. So, you know, by the time I got to secondary school, I had the people started saying, who is auntie? Who is mommy? So we're confused as children, myself and my brothers. How do we deal with this? We're going to break this woman's heart if we don't call her mommy again. And we have our mom that we've been calling auntie towing forever. So we start calling her mama. So we call my grandma mama, and we call my mom mommy. So after a while, which was fine. You know, mama is like a big mom. So she was fine with that. Because they're very strong business women. by year two, my mom was open to, do you want to involve yourself in any business at all? And I was interested. I was an engineer, remember, chemical. Engineering does not take jokers. But I was a joker. Been there in the first place. And that's why when they said chemical engineering, I'm sure you thought, Really? How? Yes. So, year two, I started doing business. I was selling clothes. I was one dressing up all my friends. I was going to Italy. I was going to Paris. Going everywhere. I bring it to school. I was selling to all the Unilag big girls. And Unilag runs girls. It's okay. They were my customers, bags, shoes. So, you know, I always had a lot of money. For a girl that they're still paying her fees and all that, I had a lot of money. And these people were people that, they're not working for their money, so it's free money. So they can spend it, so they'll buy, 
They are not working. They will buy suits just because they want to look the parts. So I was doing that in year two. Now, I was late for a lot of classes, though, I must confess. In fact, I hated those classes. The moment we get into class, I sleep off. There was a particular lecturer that calls me Sleeping Beauty. I really didn't care. I sit at the back. I don't write my notes. And then after class, I photocopy the people in front. Year two, gone. Year three, I was still doing my business, making all my money, enjoying it. You know, by year four, you know, there's way your GPA just stares at you and you're like, ha, what am I going to leave this place with? That third class was staring. Hmm. It was staring so hard. In fact, there was one of the trips I went for and a friend's cousin saw me on the flight. And he told their mom, that's a friend's mom, that that friend your daughter is always with, she's a bad girl. Oh. During school, I'm sure she's going to see Aristos. She was on a flight coming from London. And my friend said, no, don't worry, that one is just business. That's all she knows. You know, that was the kind of girl I was. But by year four, I realized, ah, that class won't be funny. Because even if you want to make money, at least have sense. And you can't go back and do five years again. So I made friends with the first class students in the class. They were guys. All those my female friends that were always pulling me to club parties and all. I left them. I stopped gisting with them. I see them only in the hostel. So I had these two guys. They were the two first class students. They come to call me when it's time to study. I don't want to study, but I need someone to push me. And these ones are always studying. They'll study. Now, I wait for them to study, because remember, they, they already know everything. They'll be teaching me. They're my lecturer, teaching me, teaching me, which is perfect. When we get to the exam, or when I have a brain block, because, you know, people that read last minute, they will have a brain block. They will. There's no two way about it. When I see those codes, and my brain is spinning, then they remind me of the notes. They, they will never teach me, which is the part I didn't like. I thought they would just pass the paper, and I'll just write everything, but they never did that. They'll just remind me of the code. So I was able to narrowly escape that third class. So I declare I finished the tutu, which was fine. Yes, praise the Lord. <laughs> but you see, in year five, something strange happened. I noticed that um, then they introduced business and engineering. Business and engineering came in year five, which is the final year. But I was always in front. And I wasn't sleeping. I had every note. I was writing every single thing. I'm telling you this so you can understand where I'm coming from. I had every single note. You know, the classes, the exam, I did very well. So I knew, no, I'm not going to go on the rig. What am I going to do there? First, I was clear. I want to stay at home with my children. I'm definitely not going on the rig. I don't know how I got here, but at least I can deal with where I'm going. So I started looking at opening um, factories. I looked at pure water. I looked at different things, you know, leaving school. But of course, young girl by then, I was 22 or something, tiny girl. I didn't know much. So we graduated. Now, in that year six, a gentleman came into my life. Broom, 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 before I could say what was going on. Bam, I was married as I left school. So I didn't even have the opportunity to decide what was I going to do with my life. When we were doing graduation, I was having a baby in America. So I didn't even join them. So that's to tell you how much I've been a businesswoman. So you'd expect that, you know, someone that's done business this long, would, um, okay, someone that's done business this long will be successful at everything she does. A lot of my friends think, ah, for me, is okay. She's made all the money and all. And sometimes, you know, there's this um, phrase in Yoruba, I, I don't know how to say well, but the first money a young person has, they're going to waste it on food, mm -hmm. on a car to be precise. So when I was getting married, I had money, I had fixed deposits in GTB, everything. I first withdrew that one to spend on my wedding because really, what do I need money for? Uh -uh. How old am I? There's still time. I'm just 22. So, and I was already having millions. Ah, ah, that means there's more to come. Mm -hmm. So, I did a share before all of them. They were. You know, it was the biggest wedding. I had a blast. I had a nice time. But I didn't know that the future was holding on plenty. You know. 
I had a car, my mother gave me a car. You know, so it was as if, ah, ah, you are just going to be flowing. But I don't know why at every point in time, I actually always thought life is not a bed of roses. It just always, had always been behind my mind. But I thought, mm, that's just a saying that they say. So I started my travel business. Now I'm also someone that I don't know how to do things ordinarily. So if I'm selling clothes and everybody sells clothes, I'm going to sell it with a difference. It's me. It's my passion. It's because I was born an entrepreneur. So when I started travel, I started it differently. I started with packages. It, was about, it wasn't about the tickets because I knew I came into an industry where there were giants, huge giants. Who are you? I was 24 at this time. Yeah? Yeah, because I just had my daughter. I was 24, 25. So and we had the likes of Touchdown. We had Five Star. We had HLG. So I'm a small fry now compared to all these people. But there was something that we're not doing. They were not doing packages. So I started with packages. My travel colleague would tell you, I was one of the, I was practically at that time the youngest in that industry. But because I came with a dream, and that's why you have Kony. Kony was my dream. Kony, I don't know if anybody has seen Kony. Kony is a big holiday company in the UK that has expanded to all over the world. In fact, when we wanted to build our first website, I just told them, just stay on Kony. Just copy and paste. They had to keep telling me, Ma, we can be sued. I said, no, no, don't worry. It is Nigeria. Nobody can sue. That's how much. I just wanted to be the Kony. Have a beautiful office. You know, just deliver holidays. And of course, did it start off well? Yes. The airlines then noticing us. Transcorp Hilton called us when we were doing their road show. We took them all over the world. It was still my tiny self. I remember the day I was doing that presentation. And when I, the MD said, so where is the MD? of the company. And I did like that. And he looked at me. <laughs> I'm sure he thought, this team, they think I'm stupid. What's the meaning of all this? Maybe one of them, I've just brought a friend. But when I presented, he was convinced, gave me the money. So remember, I'd still counting a lot of money young. And now they're paying me $100,000, $200,000. It's no big deal. I did it. I, never, I didn't even have an IATA license at that time. But they trusted me because I use sweet mouth, everything, everything. We got it. After that, there were other airlines that wanted to partner with people to do such. They started using us. So one tra World and Travel Land became a company known for holiday packages. The state government needed someone to handle their travel. They gave it to us. Now remember, once you've taught state's money, you're on <laughs> So they're traveling, they're paying 50 million, 70 million. But at no time did I remember what if this stops? What if anything happens? It was going well. Then, of course, I got the airtel license. We're selling and all. And then 2014. Now, before that, my wake-up time is 3 o'clock in the morning. So when you hear this, you say, fantastic. That's a mind, you know, that's a sensible woman. I wake up 3 a.m. in the morning. I respond to all my emails by 4 or 5, and then I go to bed. So by the time I come to work, all I'm doing at work is just managing people because I have a, a team of 40. So I just manage them, but I send my meals by three. That was then, no, because I've learned. <laughs> so I wake up, I'll do all that. So that was what I, I was hard working. I had no problem with the work. I had no problem with the traveling to meet suppliers. I was always in every trade show. I was always there, South African trade show, the UK. I was everywhere. So 2014, so that was where the, this, okay, the idea came from. Okay. So 2014, the, I heard when you said your story. Then competition came into the market, huge, 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 huge. I'm sure my colleague will know what I'm talking about. Huge. They had mad money to spend. So their marketing was mad. What were they doing? They were on CNN. They were on BB. Any, name it. And Wantra had to position now. World and Travel Land, we can't be sleeping. So we started doing the same first. Remember, we had a plan. But we started doing the same because why would these people just take over the whole market? So we went into partnerships with DSTV. We would, it was a butter agreement. We would issue tickets to them. They would give us adverts. We should tickets to them. They give on forgetting that those tickets 
are not our own. But with the mind that you will make the money if you hit the TV. Oh, yes. Did people like the ad? Oh, definitely. People were calling. Ah, I won't try. You are made. Well done, travel land. Oh, you are everywhere. This, this, this. Mm. They were saying, we're excited, you know. We're the, big, we're the second biggest. We're excited. We're happy. And it was building up. Because you signed an agreement to give people tickets for a whole year. So in 2013, you're doing it with mind, okay, uh, how much is ticket? Even if we give them ticket over the year for 20 million, and we're able to make 70 million, mm -mm, it's okay now. But forgetting that, you should actually sit down and look at it, it's interpreting to money. So it's still building up, it's still building up. Come 2014, there's a nightmare every travel agency has, it's called BSP, it's the Billing Settlement Plan. We pay the airline every two weeks. They will just, in fact, they don't knock. It's just the direct debits. They will just say, hey, we're here to take our money. If you don't have money, they, ah, send your mail the next morning, you've defaulted. By the evening of the next day, you are off the system. So if you're off the system, what happens? You don't have anything. Then you start from ground zero. You go and give them documents. So in 2014, we started struggling to pay the BSP payment. How did we get here? So we have to call the air bank, support us. Of course, we had the banks to support us, but guess what? It was traumatic. It was every two weeks. So every two weeks, you know there's a feeling you have when you have fear, that your heart ticks. You can feel, it's like they take a stone and they hit it on your heart, on your chest. That's how you feel. If anybody here feels that, run away from whatever it is. And every time I feel that, my father died of a bad heart. So I've always thought, hey, I hope this thing won't give me high blood pressure. So I was, I was always telling my colleague at work, ah, I don't like this feeling. I hope this thing won't bring high blood pressure. I hope this thing won't bring high blood pressure. It's always too much. Every two weeks, and you think about it, every two weeks is like every day. Because before you blink, the next one is here. So this particular billing day, we had done everything. I think we even shot maybe like a four million or five million, not a lot, compared to we paying 90 million. But guess what? They don't care. Even if it's one naira, you are short. They will take it off. So that day, but I was tired. You know, when you've struggled so much, I was tired from inside. I was tired that I wasn't even ready to look for it again. I was just weak. It was traumatic. Now, if it was, you know, normally you run to your spouse because that's where I would normally run to first. But at the time, he was also having business issues that he could not even come to my aid. So it was a house where you just get home at night. I don't use medication first. I hate it. As a child, if you give medication, I'll throw it behind my bed to give you how bad I was. But I got to know a medication called Calm that is supposed to calm you so that I can, you know, sleep and wake up relaxed. So I was doing that. I started using that Calm. When I feel tired, I'll use it. You know, when I get to my bed at night, I just feel, ah. Oh, like it was a long day. Why is it a long day? Remember that you've been taking money to pay the bank. You've been taking money to pay, the, to pay them from the bank. Remember that the bank interest is growing. It's there. It's coming. It's going. You're blocking. You're just in a rat race. You're blocking one for the other. And at that time, they took it off. They shut down the system. So they shut down the system and the bank is calling you. You know, when my phone rings, I heard you say that. When my phone rings, I don't even want to look at it. I don't pick calls because I don't know if they're calling me from an unknown number. I stopped picking all the calls. I wasn't picking anymore. Now, this was going into 2015. By the beginning of 2015, I went to a friend's house. It was a Saturday. I was the one wanted to pay me for something. And it was, you know, there were a lot of people in the house. I said, what are you doing here? He said, oh, oh, we have a fellowship here on Saturdays. I said, oh, really? What are you people praying for? Because for me, what I believe it is is, if you're hardworking, you will make the money. Why do I have to be spending time at fellowship praying? Why are you lazy? You better get your head together and go to work. I remember I used to tell my husband too, when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to work and he sleep. I'm like, uncle, when are you going to work? Then you say this Yoba um, phrase, kira kita odola, which means is the, the drift is not to the swift. Mm -hmm. He was saying that, man, I used to think, this is a lazy statement, really. This is a lazy statement. But everything made sense later. So I'll do all that. They shut down the system. 
So I heard that from my friend. As I was walking out, you know, I just got that conviction. Do you think you're all the same? Those ones you go out with and you're all shining your eyes, they know where they call me. You know, you, I have always walked with my, is my strength, is my power. That's what I was telling you about the 3 a.m. People wake up at 3 a.m. to pray. Oh, I mean, I wake up at 3 a.m. to return mails, to do this, to calls. And, so it was okay. I was going on with that, moving on. And then they shut down the system. So it was a lot of struggle. A lot of staff had to resign. We didn't have money to pay. I had to downsize. It was a struggle. Then shortly before that, the end of 2014, I had gone to Harvard for a course because I was tired. You know, it was too much struggle competing with the people that had billions of dollars as their investments. That means I had nothing. And I had people's ticket that was not my ticket, and I was using it. And this course was something about um, taking your business through its life cycle. And at that place, this, you know, in Harvard, they said, why do entrepreneurs fail? And if this will help anybody, they said, because you want to be big businesses. There's a reason why you are called a, my, a small and medium enterprise. Because you are small. If you try to do the things the big companies do, you will sink. So when I went to that, it was like an eye-opener. So I came back. Now, your first pro our first problem is friends and family. They will tell you, ah, haven't you seen what so-so and so is doing? You, what are you doing? So by the time I got back, when they say, haven't you seen what so-so and so is doing? I said, that is demo. This is my own journey. I'm not interested. But guess what? At that time, the harm had been done. The main harm had been done. It was work, work, work. Everything was that struggling to pay these bills and all of course children you have to pay school fees you have to pay bills there was so many people will be calling you owing. Ah, i was just tired i was like this is my small self how did i even get into all this in 2016 of course and i birthed another business from that time of i just wanted to have money so i started doing jewelry by the side you know i make jewelry things i had done when i was in school so i started doing jewelry by the side and all that and I woke up one morning, I was having a conversation with my husband on the bed to give you, an, you know, how bad, how bad it can be when we're running another man's race. Did I have a dream? I had a dream. But I got distracted by what I saw the other people doing. So I woke up this, this June 2016 and my friend that is here, this is the first time she would ever hear this. I woke up in June 2016, chatting my husband on the bed, and I just had that hudge, touch your breast. And I touched my breast, and I felt a lump. Hey. I said, ha, ah, I can feel something. My husband said, no, it's just in your mind. I said, okay. I went the next day, went to check. My family friend is the one checking now. So she had to be firm, because I was looking straight into her eyes to pick anything. So I said, Bukola, is there anything to worry about? I said, oh, it has to definitely be removed. I said, hmm, I hope it's not cancer. He said, no, for me, it has to definitely be removed. I said, okay. I checked it two weeks after. He had grown a bit. He said, for me, what's your plan? I said, okay, I'll go to America and check it, but I guess there's nothing, right? He said, not really. Not really. But I knew deep inside that I had touched that thing that I should never have touched which is letting stress, re you know, our body chemistry does not want it. And all that time I was saying, I thought it was high blood pressure that would come. It was not high blood pressure. Now, what confirmed my fears? Of course, I got there. They looked me in the eyes. How old are you? Is it hereditary? They did it. Says, no, it's not hereditary. They looked at it. Ma'am, you've got breast cancer. I thought the whole world collapsed. This is me that wake up 3 a.m. in the morning. I want to work hard. I'm always doing everything. You know, I wake up at 3, I'm walking, I'm walking. So now, I want to walk, but I cannot walk. I said, okay. So I said, okay. People have breast cancer and Abby. They don't die now. What's the big deal? Okay, so what next? Then the guy goes, I said, okay, so there'll be medication. And she said, no. By the way, this one, and that's why there's a hospital bed. This presentation was done by my staff without me having a chat with him because I never even told them. I said, this one is the one that they have not found the cause. It is not protein related. It is not estrogen related. But I, we think it's lifestyle. So far, 
nobody knows yet. So does that confirm what I'm saying? It's stress. Too much stress that my age and my body could not handle. I said, no medications, nothing. They can't do anything. The best we can do for you, we'll do chemotherapy, we'll do radiation, and that's it. I thought I was gone. You know, when you say depression, at that time I took a back st step and I thought, what is most important in life? Is it the money? Is it peace? Is it to make sure, you know, you're just okay? I just could not. This was the worst one year of my life, 2016. I called my husband one day and I said to him, what do you think caused it? You were expecting to say, ah, no, nothing, blah, blah, blah. I said, the poor guy too has been frustrated of this is very hardworking woman. He said, priorities. I said, eh, hey, why? He said, no, all you have time for is your work, your work, your work, your work. Ah. So I think it was a time God wanted to separate me and let me see what can come out of the race I was running. I was away six months, eight months, but you know, something was shocking. I got back at the end of 2016. Now, I did chemotherapy, by the way. I lost all my hair. I did everything. But at that time, I was in a place where I just thought, am I going to die? Is this how it's just going to end? Ah, there's a lot I should be able to do. I got back. That was the first year that my company got awards. That was the first year. They got award in ticketing this. They got award in that. Remember, I was away for the whole year. So I thought God wanted to tell me, it is not what you do. It's not your waking up at three. Every proposal I wrote before that, every, they will say, oh, somebody just came last week, we've done it. I'll even be fighting them. What do you mean? He's a lie. You probably took our own proposal and you gave it to people you know. Now, this was now the year as I go back that those companies were coming to us to say, we want to work with you. We want to do this with you. We want to do that with you. I didn't write proposals then. I just did what? I was minding my business. A lot of people in the industry thought, ah, Fumi has become so lazy. This is not Fumi. But life became, success had another meaning. Remember someone said, it was success. Someone said, oh, family, this, this. That's even too much to say. All that is too much. Success is just peace. It's peace and contentment. Because I got to a place of contentment where all those things didn't matter. The bags, the shoes, the clothes, it didn't matter because that year, they were giving me money to buy bags. Oh, I couldn't buy them because I saw death staring at me. And I kept telling myself, will you be able to carry it? You better don't waste your money. So that was where I was. So when I say competition is a killer, it can take away your life. The people that have high blood pressure, I got a second chance to leave. Some people have a stroke, they go. Some people heart attack, they go. I had a second chance and I said, I'm going to use the second chance wisely. I'm going to use it wisely. So I changed my orientation about life. I got back and I, be, I became the best wife you can ever know. If my husband wakes up in the morning and he says, he doesn't feel like going to work today, I'm not going home. Hey, you don't want to go? Hey, okay, let's stay at home. Because really, when I was not there, they did better. So maybe I'm even their problem. <laughs> that I'm even there. What am I doing there? Hey, you don't want to go? Ah, no problem. They call for business lunch. All that. I said, no, my colleagues will come. My colleague here, the last time I saw him, I can't remember. But there's so many business people. I said, no, my colleague will come. Oh, there's this trip. Mm -mm -mm -mm. My colleague will come. Because why? Some things start taking more importance than those things. My children's school visiting day is more important. My husband's birthday is more important. Spending time with my children became more important. Because I realized that. And if I had gone, that was it. So I thought, as, what's, okay, I thought, so what could I have done differently? I should have just focused. I should have just stayed with what I knew. I was doing well now. Why did I get carried away by what the competitor was doing? What is my business with what the competitor was doing? I don't know what the competitor has in his pocket. I don't know what the plan the competitor has for himself. So it is focus. 
what I would have done differently is to focus. And I was looking at what Fatima gave us. And she said, be true to yourself. We need to be true to, when I saw it, I said, in fact, you said it all. You need to be true to yourself. I learned that. I became true to myself. If you get a contract of 100 million, in fact, I stopped taking government jobs. I'm sure some people will think that you must be crazy. No. Anything I think is going to come with stress, I leave it. If it's going to come with a lot of money, but a lot of stress, I'll let it go. Because now, what is more important? And one thing I also realized, if you have 100 staff and I have 10, and you're making 1 billion, no, 10 million, and I'm making 1 million, by the time you take off your overhead, and I take off mine, our bottom line is the same. So what is this trouble about? What do I want to do with the numbers? Why is it important that I want to be number one, number two, number three? It really doesn't matter. Is it putting food on the table? Or is it killing you gradually? So that is my message today. That's what I would have done differently. What did I learn? I learned trust. I was able to trust my team, not because I wanted to. Because <laughs> I'm a control freak. So I just had to trust them because I had no choice. Mm -hmm. I was the only signatory. I had to make two people signatory because I had to go away. So I learned and I was able to release. So I had to trust. Integrity, consistency. I learned to stay true. Whatever I know how to do, do it well. And stay there. Those times will come that it will pay off. When we're trying to jump 10 steps at a time, I noticed that it all has its repercussion. I used to say something to someone I didn't know I was saying it to myself. That if you are young and all your friends are old, you'll be having problems of that age. <laughs> I didn't know it was myself, you know. So if you're 50 years old, no, you're 30 and your friends are all in their 50s. Remember in 50 as a woman, is menopause, is this, is that. You will start having those issues because those are the people you've surrounded yourself with. So obviously, I was talking to myself and I used to say, you know, that about other people. So that is what I've learned. I'm committed to God. Now I say, I said, look, if you're going to live two years, live it well. So imagine how it is after going through all this. What now becomes important is, oh, you go for check. Oh, you're fine, ma'am. You can go home. Oh, thank you. So I go all the way, 10 hours, to just hear, you're fine, ma'am. But any time I try to say, there's no need to go now. You're, my heart will skip. Are you sure you can handle this? So imagine if I had been told this can happen. I can tell you I would have taken the break since. Oh. But nobody ever sees things like this coming. So I think success to me, to round it up, is peace and contentment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Yes? OK, so I'm sure we have questions. Um, we'll just take a few. Do we have questions, or do we move on? OK, we have a question there, Mark. Hello for me. Good evening. Good evening. Um, thanks for sharing your story with us. And uh, I quite relate with a lot of things you've said. Number one, that entrepreneurs are born. And we also started doing business at a very young age. And um, maybe a little bit different in, the, in terms of being, you know, finding peace and contentment at what you do. I also believe um, God also helped me learn that early. You know, they say, Experience is the best teacher, but most times I, I try to learn from other people's mistakes. So, I'd, you know, when young guys like walk 24 hours, blah, 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 but I learned to appreciate rest and sleep early enough that even when young people are saying, I'm waking by 6 o'clock, I said I can't wake by 6 o'clock. What am I rushing to do, right? So I, I take my time and have my seven hours, eight, and that's why I don't get sick. I don't take drugs like you to... Right. So, but this is the question I wanted to ask. Um, I believe I know the company you're talking about that you know came into the um, the industry and you try to compete with them. But you also went to Harvard, and as business people, we're not just here to tell our stories, but we're also here to learn from 
each other as business people. So I've had this key question in mind to ask you, right? Because um, the press at outside, you know, showed me a quote, and the quote read, "You have to recognize your mistakes, you have to admit them, you have to learn from them, and you have to forget them." Right? So. If you were to do things differently, right, because this company has come and they are eating up your market share, how would you have competed better? What would you have done as a smaller company in order to sustain your customers and your business, right? What would you have done? Yes. Um, thank you. First, I'd like to correct. They didn't even take our market share. They didn't. There was no need for the competition. They didn't take the market share. The market is huge. One person can take the whole market. But you know when that's all you are just focused on because friends and family are telling you, oh, have you seen, have you seen all, you know? So what I would do differently is first, like I said, you need to be true to yourself. You need to have, like what I said, what was the plan? What was the strategy? I had a plan. I wanted to be Kony. Kony is not on CNN. They are not on TV. That's, that's when I said, does anyone know Kony? And a lot of people didn't say yes. Because Kony is quietly in their corner. Um, other ones that know the, um, the Instagram and all, the, all those other things, they're nowhere now. The ones that know the CNN and the BBC, they're no more existing. But learning from the mistakes others have made, I would say that if I do it again, I would stay with where I was and just continue with that. I was a good talk company. I was a good, it was a good talk company. That's why I first said, we're making money. We're doing, we did the, um, the Transcop Hilton Roadshow. They went to over 20 countries, or over, no, over 10 countries, and we took them everywhere. I think that's good enough for a startup. We were doing that. We had the government's work. Remember that all those people did not come because of CNN adverts. We didn't have the money to do that yeah. then. But we had all that. The airlines had partnered with us, and they were giving us discounted tickets to sell packages. We didn't have IATA then, so we did not have tickets to trade. Do you understand what I'm saying? So all the success the company holds today was all done before we went into the competition. So what I would have just done was stayed true and continued my race. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> So mine is not a question, it's actually a comment. I just wanted to commend you and thank you for the courage to share, to share your story with us tonight. Very inspiring and I've learned so much, particularly the ability to be able to prioritize and learn to rest. You know, I think that was very, very instructive for me and I want to thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so my question is, where do you draw the line between resting and just being comfortable in your comfort zone that you don't want to push yourself to do something better? Okay. I agree with you, but I'll also tell you what I've noticed, that our body tells us the truth, even though we ignore it. When you're tired, your body will tell you it's tired. A lot of times, we ignore it thinking, oh, I'm a superman, I'm a superwoman. And when you're being redundant and being lazy, you really know. You know when all is wrong with you, that you've not submitted that proposal, it's because you're just procrastinating. You don't need anybody to tell you that. You know the reason why that business has not gone ahead to where it should go to is because you're not looking ahead and you're not doing things. You know. Now, you also know when you've put in your best. Some people say maybe your best was not good enough, but guess what? Everybody's best is different. My best might just be to do the Monday to Friday, push from 8 a.m. to 5, because why? My body shuts down at 6. I might be such a person. And there's another person that their body does not shut down till 11. So we all know, the older we get, especially when you get to the eight working years, we know the truth. So it's that searching yourself and knowing that am I might be lazy. You know, we all still have issues with procrastination. A lot of people do, I still do. Now, I sometimes I even feel I'm too lazy. You know what I mean? But what I would do is, I will do the things I need to do, even if it's not comfortable, because I know I have to get them done. And the ones that I shun off that I'm not doing is because it's going to have a negative impact with me. I get clients' jobs sometimes, and I said, I'm not doing it. 
Why? Because from the first conversation I have, I can tell that you're going to give me grief. And I don't need it. I don't need someone that will call me and be screaming and shouting and walking me up. But it does not mean I'll tell my client I'm not doing. I would hand it over to a colleague and I'll say, be careful of this, 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 this person. Because if you've done the same job for so long, you see the signals. So this person is going to be most likely like this, like this. Can you handle it? In the team, that's why we're, it's called a team. In the team, some people have the temperament to handle it. Some don't. So if I don't have the temperament, my, why must I take it? All right. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much.